This podcast is brought to you by the School of Advanced Study, University of London. Nathaniel is not just uh, an impresario, as he's shown us in the last couple of days. Uh, he's made some active scholar, and he gave me his uh, introduction yesterday, and uh, he gave me a new one <coughs> <book> today. <laughs> I assumed that he just stayed up all night writing some more publications. But, uh, in fact, it's a script to me, which is it's quite entertaining, but I... I, I, I only just seen it, so uh, the main thing is I'm not responsible for it. <laughs> Dr. Nathaniel Adam Tobias Coleman. Where is he from? Dr. Coleman was born and bred in Brum. It doesn't, it's not all in verse. <laughs> even though he doesn't speak Brummy. Indeed, Dr. Coleman is a 21st century incarnation of a long line of Brummy academics. Consider three of those Brummy scholars. In the 20th century, in 1968, Enoch Powell, MP, told his conservative colleagues assembled in Birmingham's Middle to Midland Hotel that because quote, immigrant communities can organize to consolidate their members, to agitate and campaign against their fellow citizens, and to overawe and dominate the rest with the legal weapons. He, power, filled with foreboding. Like the Roman, he seemed to see the river Tiber foaming with much blood. Well, he's a dead white man. Yeah. <laughs> and I might be, before I get to the end of this, there's, there's, there's loads of it. And many of you, I still hope there's no to talk. <laughs> many people don't realize that Power was quoting from Virgil's Aeneid. Dr. Coleman realizes this because, just like Power, he took a double first class degree in Greek and Latin. Powell's paltry three-year degree in classics from Cambridge was no match for Dr. Coleman's four-year degree from Oxford, a degree famous for subjecting its undergraduates to the world's most intensive examinations, second only to those demanded by the Chinese civil service. Uh, did you pass those as well? <laughs> Powell and Dr. Coleman prepared for Oxbridge by studying classics at King Edward School, Birmingham. Went to the same school. In Dr. Coleman's day, this was known as the best performing school in Britain. Beat that, Michael Gove. <laughs> Dr. Coleman's mother, an immigrant from Jamaica, paid his school fees using the Conservative Government Assisted Places Scheme which Dr. Yeah. Coleman now realizes was a deeply unjust policy. <laughs> in the 19th century, we seem to be going backwards, but anyway. In the 19th century, 111 years ago, Francis Galton, another pupil of King Edward's school, Birmingham, was given the gift of long-term use of a laboratory in which to develop his new theory, eugenics. That laboratory was in 50 Gower Street. The donor of the gift was University College London. UCL now employs Dr. Coleman nearby in Gordon Square, where he works with, in a cross-disciplinary fashion, UCL's Department of Philosophy <coughs> and with UCL's Equiano Center to dismantle Galton's white dominating legacy. Yeah, yeah. In the 18th century, <laughs> in the 18th century, Joseph Priestley didn't attend King Edward's school, but he did convene a conference on political philosophy that sparked the worst riots that the city of Birmingham has ever known. Dr. Coleman doesn't intend to spark a riot, 
And he does intend, like Priestley intended, when in 1788 in Birmingham City Centre, he delivered a famous sermon on the subject, to develop arguments that explain why Negro slavery was and still is wrong and what we as a society must do to repair that wrong. I give you Dr. Coleman, impresario, and academic. William Wilberforce, conservative abolitionist or critical philosopher of race? I argue the latter. In summer 2013, I was a visiting research fellow at the Wilberforce Institute for the Study of Slavery and Emancipation at the University of Hull. The Wilberforce Institute, or WISE as we affectionately know it, <laughs> is situated next door to the birthplace of William Wilberforce, which is now Wilberforce House Museum. I recommend you try it out. I used this time to read the four books that Wilberforce, during his life, published. Yes, it might surprise you to learn that Wilberforce did publish books, for we do not today remember him for having done so. The first of these books, published in 1797, was, at least during his life, by far the most famous of his four published books. It was entitled A Practical View of the Prevailing Religious System of Professed Christians in the Higher and Middle Classes in this country, contrasted with real Christianity. It has received considerable scholarly, critical comment, not least from Christian scholars, such as Kevin <coughs> Charles Belmonte, who writes in his critical edition of A Practical View that, quote, the brilliant orator and politician Edmund Burke spent the last two days of his life reading a practical view. Not long before he died, Burke stated, If I live, I shall thank Wilberforce for having sent such a book into the world. Unquote. <coughs> By contrast, not one of Wilberforce's latter three books is available in any critical edition. Indeed, those latter three books have received little or no scholarly critical comment. Those three books are as follows. In 1807, Wilberforce published a letter on the abolition of the slave trade addressed to the freeholders and other inhabitants of Yorkshire. In 1814, Wilberforce published a letter to His Excellency the Prince of Talleyrand Perigord on the subject of the slave trade. And in 1823, Wilberforce published an appeal to the religion, justice, and humanity of inhabitants of the British Empire in behalf of the Negro slaves in the West Indies. I do not doubt that these three books have been neglected because they reveal Wilberforce to have been less a great white male abolitionist of the right and more a pioneering critical philosopher of white domination. We can most clearly see this, in, this early critical philosopher of race in action in the 19th century in his philosophical explanation for why Negro slavery is morally wrong. However, as it has been more recently developed in the 20th century, the discipline of the critical philosophy of race has focused on philosophers in the USA who respond to political problems in the USA. This parochialism has meant that British philosophers who theorize and who theorize racial injustice, such as the abolitionist William Wilberforce, are overlooked. Moreover, it has meant that political debates, which have no purchase in the USA, such as debates about the content of a national curriculum, are overlooked too. <coughs> this essay 
traces, therefore, the early origins of the critical philosophy of race as that discipline arose here in Britain in response to racial injustice in Britain. My argument will proceed in three parts. Gove on Wilberforce. Wilberforce on degradation. Gove on degradation. Part one. Gove on Wilberforce. According to Michael Gove, the Secretary of State for Education, Quote, we have a compulsory history curriculum in secondary schools that doesn't mention a single historical figure, except William Wilberforce and Olauda Equiano, unquote. Now, some commentators have interpreted Gove's observation as a criticism of the current compulsory curriculum. For instance, John Prescott <coughs> has concluded that, quote, Gove would rather Equiano and the anti-slavery campaign of William Wilberforce were written out of history Unquote. Yet Gove has not written Equiano and Wilberforce out of his new curriculum. We can see this if we compare what the curriculum due to expire in 2014 and the curriculum due to begin in 2014 each say about Equiano and Wilberforce. On the one hand, according to the current compulsory curriculum, quote, all pupils should be taught the nature and effects of the slave trade. And this study of the slave trade should include resistance, the abolition of slavery, and the work of people such as Olauda Equiano and William Wilberforce, unquote. On the other hand, according to Gove's new compulsory curriculum, quote, pupils should be taught about the slave trade and the abolition of slavery and the role of Olauda Equiano in free slave. Moreover, quote, pupils should be taught about the lives of significant individuals in Britain's past who have contributed to our nation's achievements. Mm -hmm. This, we are told, includes the lives of, quote, reformers such as William Wilberforce, unquote. <coughs> Yet notice that, whereas the current compulsory curriculum requires that we teach the work of Equiano and Wilberforce, Gove's new compulsory curriculum requires that we teach the role of Equiano, but the life of Wilberforce. Indeed, whereas the current compulsory curriculum requires that we teach both Equiano and Wilberforce to older pupils aged between 11 and 14 years, Gove's new compulsory curriculum requires that we continue to teach Equiano to older pupils, but that we teach Wilberforce to younger pupils, aged between five and seven years. To see why it matters at what age we teach this to our pupils, we must ask the following question. What is the significance of this distinction between a role and a life? Understanding a person's role is a relatively complex task. Since understanding a person's role requires a prior understanding of the common goal towards which that person is contributing, and of the contribution of other persons towards that common goal. By contrast, understanding a person's life is a relatively simple task. Since a biographical list of events and, uh, and experiences in chronological order can be grasped without any reference to goals that were held in common or contributions made by other persons to those common goals. Whereas one's life is personal, one's role is political. It places one's life in social context. To understand Wilberforce's life, our pupils need only grasp that Wilberforce was a good man who devoted all his time and energy and resources to the abolition of slavery. Indeed, this narrative of the saintly life is, in many classrooms, what is currently taught to our pupils. By contrast, to understand Wilberforce's role, our pupils would need to grasp whatever was distinctive about his contribution to the abolition of slavery. Presumably, they would need to grasp what Gove saw fit to mention as distinctive when, for his 
annual Wilberforce address to conservative Christian fellowship, he was, quote, asked to say a few words dedicated to the memory of William Wilberforce, unquote. Gove chose not to speak about Wilberforce's life, no. Gove chose to speak about, quote, Wilberforce's crusading passion for justice, unquote. Gove described Wilberforce as, quote, someone who is a crusader, someone who believes so powerfully in the dignity of each individual human soul, and someone who <coughs> fought so energetically against injustice, unquote. Gove's choice about how best to remember Wilberforce suggests that despite what his new compulsory curriculum says, he would prefer our pupils to focus less on Wilberforce's biography and more on Wilberforce's conception of justice and injustice. He would prefer our pupils to focus upon what William Hay, his Tory colleague and Wilberforce's biographer, refers to as, quote, the moral framework in which Wilberforce always placed his practical arguments, unquote. Yet, if they are to focus on that moral framework, our pupils will need to grasp the very thing that Gove has written out of his new compulsory curriculum. Namely, the nature and effects of the slave trade. I shall make two points about this phrase. Wilberforce repeats it and Wilberforce corrects it. This phrase, which appears in the current compulsory curriculum but not in the new one, is a direct quotation of words that Wilberforce repeatedly uses in each of his three published works on the subject. First, consider Wilberforce's letter of 1807. In this letter, during a discussion of plans for abolition that were drawn up by Edmund Burke, Wilberforce complains that in his day, quote, very little was known, even by men in general well-informed, concerning the nature and effects of the slave trade, unquote. Indeed, Wilberforce argues that, quote, from farther information than it was possible for any man then to possess concerning the nature and effects of the slave trade, unquote, Burke himself would have concluded that his own plans for abolition were inadequate. Second, consider Wilberforce's letter of 1814. In this letter, Wilberforce was, quote, greatly surprised as well as much concerned to hear that the information concerning the nature and effects of the African slave trade had been very little circulated in France, unquote. Wilberforce was at pains to draw the French diplomat's attention to not only to, quote, the nature and effects of the slave trade, unquote, but to the, quote, real nature and effects of the slave trade, unquote, and not only to, quote, the nature and consequences of the slave trade, unquote, but to the, quote, real nature and consequences of the slave trade, unquote. Wilberforce <coughs> repeatedly referred to, quote, the natural and indeed infallible effects of a traffic in man, unquote, because he thought, quote, the dreadful nature and effects of the slave trade were almost utterly unknown, unquote. Third and finally, consider Wilberforce's publication of 1823, which Wilberforce himself consistently referred to as his manifesto. In his manifesto, Wilberforce focuses on, quote, their natural effects in the depravity and moral degradation of the species, unquote. However, before we begin to identify what Wilberforce meant by, quote, the slave, tra the slave trade's natural effect of moral degradation, we need to realize that Wilberforce not only repeated this refrain, he also corrected it. In his final work, his Manifesto of 1823, Wilberforce concluded that the phenomenon he opposed was not a trade, but a system. It was, quote, a system of crimes, which was so falsely called a trade in Negroes, unquote. Indeed, as early as his letter of 1814, Wilberforce already spoke of, quote, that detestable system, strangely misnamed a trade, unquote. 
and of, quote, that dreadful system of wrong and robbery by so misapplied a courtesy of speech termed a trade in slaves, unquote. Thus, if Gove wants, as he suggests, our teaching of the so-called slave trade to tackle Wilberforce's moral framework, then he must want us to teach our pupils how that framework led Wilberforce to conclude that the natural effect of the Negro system was moral degradation. Part two, Wilberforce on degradation. Kwame Anthony Appiah would have us believe that Wilberforce's moral framework consisted in, quote, Wilberforce's appeal to British honor, unquote. However, Wilberforce's approach to morality is much more interesting than mere patriotism. Wilberforce set out his moral framework in 1797, in his first publication. In his practical view, Wilberforce argued that, quote, sympathy towards our fellow creatures by the constitution of our nature seldom fails to result from the consciousness of an identity of interests and a similarity of fortunes, unquote. Now, the word seldom here is moot. And Wilberforce knew this. To feel sympathy with another person is to adopt a certain kind of inclination towards that person. It is to be, according to Wilberforce in his letter of 1807, quote, inclined to reflect on his situation, to spare his feelings, to multiply his comforts, unquote. In this way, quote, sympathy is the great author and cherisher of every benevolent emotion, unquote. Yet we do not feel every benevolent emotion towards everybody else, precisely because we do not think of ourselves as sharing an identity of interests and a similarity of fortunes with everybody else. As Wilberforce knew only too well, what sympathy, if any, we feel towards another person is correlated with the social status that we take that person to have. As Wilberforce put it in his letter of 1807, quote, in proportion as any being is considered as possessing a higher or a lower place in the scale of existence, in that same proportion shall we be disposed to consider him as entitled to a larger share of our kind consideration. In short, in the same proportion will sympathy be awakened in his behalf." Unquote. Thus, the challenge of sympathy, as Wilberforce saw it, is that although we, have, we owe sympathy to every other person, we feel sympathy only for some other persons. Within this moral framework, which I have dubbed the challenge of sympathy, Wilberforce placed three practical arguments about the Negro system. Namely, an argument that its moral defect is degradation, an argument that that degradation is durable, and an argument that that degradation is marital. Let us consider each in turn. <clears throat> First, Wilberforce thought that the challenge of sympathy was fraught by a second challenge, which we might call the challenge of changing status. One's social status could change, with the result that one's entitlement to kind's consideration might change accordingly. Now, on the one hand, Wilberforce recognized the progressive potential of such an additional challenge. For instance, in his letter of 1814, Wilberforce thought that since their emancipation and independence from France, the enslaved population of Saint Domingo had, quote, been raised in the scale of being, unquote. Yet on the other hand, any phenomenon that, any phenomenon that results 
in are considering some being to possess, quote, a lower place in the scale of existence, unquote, is, in Wilberforce's language, degradation. Indeed, etymologically, from Latin de meaning down and gradus meaning a step, to degrade someone is to bring that person down a step. It is morally wrong, according to Wilberforce, to bring a person down a step in this way. It violates, quote, their just claim to the rights and privileges of the human species, unquote, because it is, quote, a gross infraction on the just claims of our common species, unquote. We all share in common the fact that we are human, and this fact endows each of us with a just claim to kind consideration <laughs> from each other. This just claim each person employ, enjoys is the ground of our moral duty to sympathize with every other person. Our failure to sympathize with persons enslaved as Negro is precisely the moral wrong that Wilberforce thinks that the Negro system embodies. Noticing this fact, Brick and Carey tells us that, quote, a core argument in Wilberforce's call to abolish the slave trade, unquote, was Wilberforce's argument that, quote, the man of feeling sympathetically feels the pain which the slaves actually suffer. Those who do not feel the pain are both callous brutes and thoroughly unfashionable. <laughs> Wilberforce himself, in his letter of 1807, put it thus, quote, the various moral defects of the Negro system appear to me to often to be almost entirely caused and always to be extremely augmented by the Negroes as a race being sunk into the lowest state of degradation, unquote. This degradation, according to Wilberforce, quote, by extinguishing sympathy, rendered the yoke of African slavery so peculiarly galling, unquote. This, then, is the conclusion of Wilberforce's first practical argument about the Negro system, that its defect is degradation. Second, according to Wilberforce in his letter of 1807, the fact that a person enslaved as Negro was uniquely, quote, the victim of degradation, unquote, explains why in West Indian slavery there was, quote, no place for sympathy, unquote, whereas in ancient slavery, sympathy was, quote, often in lively exercise, unquote. Now, in his explanation of the difference between the two slaveries, Wilberforce argued that for the West Indian slave, there was, um, um, only for the West Indian slave, was there, quote, a variety of circumstances, not forgetting that uh, most important particular of color, all tending powerfully to designate and to stamp them as a peculiar and that a base and degraded order of beings, unquote. By contrast, Wilberforce argues, because, quote, the slaves among the ancients in general were of the same complexion, features, and form with their masters, these masters were aware that their situation was one into which they themselves might be reduced by the fortune of war, unquote. Commenting upon this contrast, Wilberforce observes that, quote, wherever sympathy is an exercise, we feel that we ourselves might have been fated to drink from the bitter cup. Quote. Thus, Wilberforce's explanation amounts to the assertion that, quote, his color, his features, his form, his language, his employment, all tend to extinguish sympathy, unquote. Importantly, each of these bodily ways in which a person was designated a Negro has a staying power. Wilberforce, in this regard, observes that in the ancient world there existed an opportunity for, quote, the frequent elevation 
of slaves to occupations of the highest confidence and importance, with a prospect frequently realized of emerging by emancipation into a state of liberty and comfort, unquote. Now, this opportunity did not exist in the modern world, where the degradation of a person who had been enslaved as Negro was a degradation that endured even after manumission and emancipation. This, then, is the conclusion of Wilberforce's second practical argument about the Negro system, that its degradation was durable. Third, in his Manifesto of 1823, Wilberforce extended his argument about the durability of degradation. Wilberforce now argued that it was durable not only from enslavement to emancipation, but also from one emancipated generation to another. Curiously, the way in which Wilberforce conceived of degradation's multi-generational staying power was as something marital. And I quote at length, it is a farther important truth, pregnant with the most serious consequences, that the extreme degradation which is supposed to render the slaves unfit to form the marriage contract belongs not merely to their situation as slaves, but to their color as Negroes. Hence, it adheres not only to those who are forever released from slavery, but to those also who, by having one European parent, might be presumed to be raised highly above the level of the servile race. Such is the incurable infamy inherent in what still belongs to them of African origin, that they are at almost an immeasurable distance in the scale of being below the lowest of the whites." Unquote. <coughs> Part three, Gove on degradation. Now it is easy, I think, to misunderstand what Wilberforce meant when he spoke of, quote, the extreme degradation of the colored race as it affects their marriage relations, unquote. For Wilberforce's text admits of two interpretations. I shall anticipate such a misunderstanding by drawing upon two approaches to public policy recently adopted by Michael Gove. His approach to policy on marriage and his approach to policy on adoption. Our distinguishing between Gove's different approaches to these two political issues will help us distinguish two different approaches that Wilberforce takes to the political issue of durable marital degradation. First, take Gove's approach to marriage. Now, just as Wilberforce, with his medical metaphor of the incurable infamy, spoke about marital degradation in terms of disease, so too does Gove employ a metaphor that identifies marriage with health. When called upon to explain why he wants to extend legal marriage to gay men and women, Gove said, quote, I believe marriage should be defended, supported, and promoted in every way. A society which believes in commitment and which seeks to encourage people to put the enduring above the convenient and which asks people to put stability in personal relationships ahead of self-interest, is a healthier society." Unquote. This approach, which is committed to the fundamental value of legal marriage, is shared by Wilberforce. Admittedly, in his earlier work, his practical view of 1797, Wilberforce seems to have had a gendered view of the value, fundamental value of legal marriage, for, quote, the wedded state, unquote, Wilberforce tells us, quote, seems to afford to the married man, unquote, whenever he, quote, returns to his family, worn and harassed by worldly cares or professional labors, unquote, a wife who, quote, might revive his languid piety. <laughs> Marriage makes men better Christians. 
However, in his later work, in his Manifesto of 1823, Wilberforce, like Gove, seems to have had a more general view of the fundamental value of legal marriage. He tells us that marriage is, quote, the wellspring of all charities of life, the source of all domestic comfort and social improvement, the moral cement of civilized society, unquote. It is, quote, that growing attachment, that mutual confidence, which spring from an identity of interest, from the common feeling for a common progeny, with all the multiplied emotions of hope, and even of fear, of joys, and even of sorrows, which bind families together, unquote. It is, quote, the great expedient for maintaining the moral order and social happiness of mankind. Unquote. Now, if Gove and Wilberforce are correct in thinking that marriage is fundamentally valuable in this way, then we might think that we can begin to make sense of Wilberforce's contention that degradation consisted in what he sometimes calls, quote, the want of marriage, unquote, or, quote, this neglect of marriage, unquote, and the fact that, quote, they are strangers to the institution of marriage, unquote. On this first interpretation of Wilberforce, the idea would be that owing to the moral degradation of the Negro system, the rate of marriage among persons enslaved as Negro was low. For this reason, Persons enslaved as Negro lacked something that would have brought them health, salvation, or social harmony. Let us call this interpretation the thesis of meager marriage. Now, some sociologists have a version of the thesis of meager marriage. Sociologists have compared cross-racial marriage marriage that is that crosses or transgresses an established racial boundary with cis racial marriage marriage that, which is that stays on one side of an established racial boundary some sociologists have found that cross racial marriage is valuable to those who are racialized in a degrading way for instance in 1964, Milton Gordon found that for Italian Americans, their high rate of cross-racial marriage with Anglo-Americans was evidence that they had succeeded in entering the, quote, social cliques, clubs, and institutions of the core society at the primary group level, unquote. This suggests that we have reason to be concerned if, as Wilberforce said it would, meager rates of marriage across the boundary established between racial blackness and racial whiteness endure. Indeed, such rates do endure. According to the Office for National Statistics in England and Wales in 2001, quote, white people are the least likely to be married to someone outside their ethnic group. Only 1% of white men and women had done so, unquote. Focus on those who had done so. Quote, almost 5 in 10 other black men, 48%, and 3 in 10 black Caribbean men, 29%, were married to women outside the black ethnic group, in most cases to white women, unquote. By contrast, although in general, quote, patterns of inter-ethnic marriage were similar for men and women, unquote, the sole exception to this similarity is that, quote, black women were less likely than black men to have married outside their ethnic group, unquote. From this statistic, we might be tempted to conclude that durable marital degradation consists in the meager rates of marriage between black women and white men in England and Wales. Yet such a conclusion would be a mistake. 
For as Erica Chito Childs has argued, quote, the experiences of black-white couples are a minus canary, unquote. That is to say they are like, quote, the canaries that miners use to alert them to a poisonous atmosphere. <laughs> Unquote. In this way, those experiences, quote, reveal problems of race that otherwise can remain hidden, especially to whites, unquote. Now, although for Chito Charles, what counts as the canary are the social experiences of black-white couples only once they are in a relationship, it seems to me that the social experiences of persons who might have become black-white couples but amid that poisonous atmosphere, didn't also count as that canary. Thus, we should reject the thesis of meager marriage. And we should instead inc conclude that durable marital degradation consists in the poisonous atmosphere of which meager rates of marriage between black women and white men are merely an indication. Gove's approach to adoption helps us to understand what that poisonous racial atmosphere might be. According to Gove, quote, the reality is that a black child is three times less likely to be adopted from care than a white child, unquote. Gove argues that, quote, it is simply disgraceful that a black child is three times less likely to be adopted from care than a white child, unquote. Because, quote, it is outrageous to deny a child the chance of adoption because of a misguided belief that race is more important than any other factor, unquote. Who exactly is denying children the chance of adoption? because of uh, this outrageous and misguided belief. A recent poll conducted for the think tank British Future found that on the one hand, among white respondents, as many as 50% thought an ethnic match in adoption was optimal and only 39% thought it was irrelevant. Whereas on the other hand, among Britons who are themselves not white, only 33% thought an ethnic match in adoption was optimal, but as many as 51% thought it was irrelevant. As a headline in the Daily Telegraph put it, quote, racial matching in adoption is a white obsession, unquote. The whiteness of this obsession is something about which we have known since at least 1965 when the four-year-long British Adoption Project was established specifically to challenge the way in which children racialized as black were viewed by adoptive parents racialized as white and adoption agencies racialized as white, viewed as cross-racially unadoptable. Now this distinction between a low rate uh, of cross-racial adoption and a bad reputation for cross-racial unadoptability can help us. For analogously, we can draw a distinction between a low rate of cross-racial marriage and a bad reputation for cross-racial unmarriageability. Wilberforce's talk of the incurable infamy suggests he was less concerned about rates and much more concerned about reputations. Thus, we can reject the concern about the low rate of cross-racial marriage together with its dubious commitment to the fundamental value of legal marriage. It's in favor of a concern for a bad reputation for cross-racial unmarriageability. In Wilberforce's words, we are concerned about, quote, the degradation of the Negro race in the eyes of the whites, unquote. 
We are concerned about a poisonous atmosphere, quote, degrading the slaves in the eyes of all who are in authority over them, and thereby extinguishing that sympathy, which would be their best protection. Thus, Wilberforce would probably argue that meager rates of marriage between black women and white men indicates an atmosphere poisoned by how white men see black women. Importantly, Wilberforce tells us that, quote, this West Indian prejudice is only against a moral union and connection for the immoral connection with this degraded class of the female population is almost universal." Unquote. Thus, according to Wilberforce, the white male view that black women are cross-racially unmarriageable went hand in hand with the white male view that black women are cross-racially hypersexual. Wilberforce gives an example of this white male view in action when he mentions, quote, a gentleman sometime resident in Barbados, unquote, who speaks, quote, with real humanity of the free colored people and even suggests a plan through the medium of a moral union of the sexes among the colored people in the colonies for the gradual emancipation of those slaves. Unquote. However, Wilberforce tells us, this same gentleman, quote, very strongly depreciates any attempt to introduce any such connection between them and the white inhabitants. Unquote. Now, why in the eyes of this white man are black women good enough for cis racial marriage, but not good enough? for cross-racial marriage? Wilberforce answers by quoting from what he calls the celebrated history of Jamaica. According to the historian Edward Long, quote, ludicrous as the opinion may seem, I do not think that an orangutan husband would be any dishonor for an Hottentot female. For what are these Hottentots? They are, say the most credible writers, a people certainly very stupid and very brutal." Unquote. <coughs> this, then, is what Michael Gove should want us to teach our pupils about William Wilberforce. Not his saintly life, but rather his moral argument that the Negro system durably degraded black women in the eyes of white men. In his annual Wilberforce address to conservative Christian fellowship, <coughs> Gove tells us that, quote, there are many who are surprised when they hear the story of Wilberforce and the huge impact that he made on the conscience of the nation." Unquote. I do not doubt that there will be many who are surprised to hear the moral arguments of Wilberforce and the huge implications of those arguments for conservative policy on our national curriculum. Um, we'll follow the conventions, questions in groups of three, keep your question short, introduce yourself. I have Brian over there, second one over there, do I have a third? I have a third over there, right. Thank you Brian, Glucks and Bernard Hall. Um, thank you Natalia for that really um, fascinating um, talk about World Wars. I have to say I didn't know about the nature of the arguments that he made. Uh, and, and since um, 
I happen to live on Wilberforce Road. I do too. I feel that it introduced me to my street as well, in a way which I didn't know it previously. My question to you really is this. You, 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 you explained that Wilberforce placed emphasis on the idea of degradation. This was the defect in the system, in the oppressive system, that it was a degradation of human beings. Um, is there a connection between that and his, so to speak, Christian message? I mean, was it, was it, was it the case that he saw the degradation as unchristian and that he saw the reversing, reversing that process as a process of Christianizing? Maybe we should take it away. I, I, I'll take it away, yes. Karen says O'Connor, I teach at Buffalo State College. Um, I wondered if you might comment a little bit on a similar case, uh, the case of Mary Seacole in the National History Curriculum. There have been all kinds of arguments about Mary Seacole. She's not British, she's not black, she uh, does not fit in the uh, history curriculum. Where do you stand on that? Or do you have any opinion at all on uh, Seacole and her place in the curriculum? And then my question's about the effects of our ability to sympathize with people above us as opposed to below us. So I first came across this argument with Smith in the theory of all sentiments, this idea that we've got disposition to be sympathetic to those above us and not below us. And that was tied to Smith's view in the world of nations that what maintains slavery is pride and not economics. So people who have slaves will hang on to them even when economically it's disadvantageous because this maintains their sense of pride. I was wondering, was, did Smith know well before his argument, or were these arguments about sympathy and the effect of status on sympathy quite common at the time? I'm just totally ignorant. Thank you very much. So I take it that uh, degradation is wrong because it uh, it upsets a um, an equality uh, that. Uh, is owed to persons, and that equality is owed to persons in virtue of their humanity, and I take it um, uh, that this will be grounded in some sort of um, uh, argument like, um, we are all equally the children of God. Um, that's my thought, um, although I, uh, I, I hesitate to, uh, I don't have a quotation from uh, the practical view for you, um, but that seems to be the way uh, that the Christianity will come into it. Of course, the Christianity also comes into it in that way. Um, not participating in uh, the illegal institution of marriage is not participating in a Christian institution. Um, Wilberforce didn't really seem to uh, consider that marriage might be practiced by persons of other religious persuasions. Um, so he thought that um, in being rendered or in being depicted as unmarriageable, black women were being um, uh, denied uh, the most important part of Christianity. Uh, and for Wilberforce, the marriage institution is that important. Mary Seacole is British. I believe um, her father was Scottish. Mary Seacole, my mother, recently, uh, after I got my degree at Oxford, my mother, who uh, left school uh, with almost no qualifications, uh, was suddenly inspired to go back to university, even with four children, and she qualified to be a nurse, and she's I'm very proud uh, of my mother, uh, who is a nurse. And she stands in a long line of Jamaican women who nurse predominantly persons racialized as white in this country. And this is what Mary Seacole did in the Crimea, but she didn't only do that. I have a colleague in Scotland, uh, she's African-American, I forget her name, but I will um, search her out and uh, mention, you to, mention her to you. Um, she's actually doing work to recover the lost history of Mary Seacole. She wasn't just another Jamaican female nurse. Mary Seacole was a businesswoman. Mary Seacole went to South America and was setting up inns there. That's, what she, that's why she went to the Crimea, not because she cared about these poor soldiers, but because she wanted to make a living. Uh, she was an incredible woman, partly because uh, she was a widow, I think. She became widowed uh, um, uh, very early 
in her life. So she was able to use the money and use her um, independence, which of course not a lot of women in the 19th century had, to travel the world and set up franchises and make a huge buck. She is a, I want her on the curriculum, not so that we perpetuate the stigmatizing idea that uh, women racialized as black have come here to clean up after you, but so that we <laughs> encourage students in this country to think that, wow, black women are business persons. They make money. They bring in the bucks. Um, what maintains slavery is pride, not economics. Really? Adam Smith. Oh, no, I'm not speaking to you, I'm speaking to Adam Smith. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, how did Adam Smith enjoy his sinecure in Glasgow? How did Glasgow become so wealthy at the time when Adam Smith was writing his work? It wasn't the invisible hand that made Glasgow wealthy. It was the whip hand that made Glasgow wealthy. Adam Smith is du he is not <laughs> to be believed. He has three arguments against slavery that appear early, uh, well, uh, before the major campaign against Negro slavery, which really took off around the time of Joseph Priestley's uh, speech. That's why it's so important, the speech of 1788. Of course, um, uh, Adam Smith is writing 1776, and uh, his three arguments are scattered. They're not in any consolidated form, so he doesn't really care about this issue. He drops it in that uh, um, enslaved persons are not innovative. Uh, it costs more to keep them. I and he does, I guess, have a fourth argument about uh, um, uh, people keeping them only because of pride. Uh, interestingly enough, uh, he published a, um, uh, an additional edition of his uh, Wealth of Nations once the uh, debate really had got started. Uh, I think it was 1789 or 1790 or 91. And um, he added a preface to this. And in that preface, he uh, argued for gradualism in social change. And one scholar has identified that there are passages from this preface that were reproduced almost verbatim in Parliament when they first debated whether or not to end the slave trade. So that's the influence that Adam Smith had on the abolitionist debate. He made it more gradual by that preface. Uh, I'll share the article with you uh, later. But um, uh, apart from that, which was, I guess, an obit of dicta in what you, uh, dicta in what you said, uh, could you repeat for me the, the key yeah, questions? I just wanted to know how common was this argument at the time? And was that where Smith got it in the world in theory of moral sentiments? Did he get it from Wilberforce? <laughs> or was it common knowledge, something that was going around, this idea that people found it harder to sympathize with those who were lower than them? Okay, so I guess um, uh, it's interesting to me that uh, uh, Smith thinks that it's easy or easier to sympathize with people who are above you. Um, I, I link this to what Andy Gregg said a little earlier, uh, the idea that uh, persons who are stigmatized, uh, racialized in a degrading way, might have a better understanding of the uh, social experience of persons who are racialized in a, um, I guess, a, a, dominant, a, dominant, a dominant way. Um, uh, I, I rather suspect uh, that this idea that it was difficult to um, uh, uh, sympathize with people who uh, had the lowest state of social status in the US, uh, uh, among persons racialized as white, um, not very common, but um, uh, I'm sure that among persons racialized as black, it was perfectly obvious. Okay, second round. I think you were up the first uh, in the back there and there. Then we'll come back to you. Later. Yeah, keep the question <coughs> short, please. But you're your first. Thank you, um, Anna Madandaya, philosophy, recently graduated from Edinburgh. Um, I wasn't. Can I begin by asking you about just a very quick question? Was the, I wasn't sure who was degraded. The, the slaves were degraded, or the slavers? Just All the force focuses on the enslaved. Okay. So, if um, if a group of people are being degraded by things that I am doing, um, 
am I not also being degraded by doing that? Um, and if so, um, in what way is the degradation different um, such that you know, it wouldn't be suitable for me to marry you? Um, and, you know, well, I mean, you know, what are the kind of, uh, implications there would be to the durability of that uh, degradation on the part of the paper? Uh, yes, I'm Kevin Bach, I'm a legal scholar, and uh, my area of interest is also in the Caribbean, as I mentioned yesterday. I'm just asking two questions. Um, one is about the argument about degradation. I'm wondering whether we might have been joining a discussion about dignity, and the philosophers in the room will, will understand uh, what I'm um, pointing to here. A dignity has status or rank as opposed to something which is inalienable. And I'm wondering whether the context is which something which is inalienable. Okay. Um, I'm wondering whether that argument might have been influenced by the, the revolutionary context in which these publications appeared, the Asian Revolution in particular, and the kind of discussion that would have taken place in that situation, um, including um, the discussion of mixing, which is what you're um, you, you uh, significant part of the discussion is centered around. So I wonder whether you, you thought about um, his contribution in that way. And the second is about the contribution of Mary Prince, the narrative of Mary Prince. As a, a colleague of there mentioned, Mary Seacole describes me that um, perhaps it would be interesting to see how these three different types of texts could be read together. Uh, hi, James Cockney's uh, case of philosophy. Um, sort of linked to that question uh, in part. You mentioned the San Domingo Revolution uh, briefly, and I was one I was kind of curious as to uh, where in, if you know where in goes in formulation, and in, perhaps in the current system as well, how the Asian Revolution and how the role or work, so to speak, of to some of the mature features, um, and whether, yeah, yeah, how that plays in with the white abolitionism, perhaps. Thank you. Um, just for a quotation. Um, yes, persons who are enslavers and bystanders to the institution of what well, well, never stands outside of the institution of enslavement, um, but people who are neither enslavers nor the enslaved um, uh, are degraded by the existence of uh, an institution, a slaving institution. Um, Wilberforce doesn't necessarily focus upon this, although he is interested, for instance, in the way in which uh, white men are corrupted um, by their easy access, uh, their illegitimate and unjust easy access to the bodies of black women. Um, so that's the way in which he does recognize this. But he doesn't dwell on this, unlike other philosophers. Um, certainly, uh, women racialized as black, um, women who were enslaved as Negroes, such as Mary Prince, whom I'll come to in a moment, Harriet Ann Jacobs, uh, they did um, uh, speak at length about the way in which um, their masters became unprincipled, an unprincipled master and a jealous mistress. That's what Jacobs <laughs> You can tell what Jacobs had to suffer at the hands of each of those. Neither of those two persons, Prince or Jacobs, goes as far as John Stuart Mill, who, and many people don't realize that John Stuart Mill had something to say about slavery. I rather see John Stuart Mill as uh, a Michael Dummett character, and I was um, quite taken when uh, um, uh, Robert said that uh, uh, Michael thought that the best thing that he uh, had ever, well, the, he really wished that he had written what uh, the book that Anne wrote on racial injustice. It reminded me of uh, John Stuart Mill saying that uh, his best work was written by his partner, Harriet Taylor. Yeah. Um, and it also reminded me of the way in which John Stuart Mill is uh, canonized. We don't read John Stuart Mill on the Negro question. We don't read John Stuart Mill's a lengthy review of John Eliot Cairns's The Slave Power. But we read on liberty, 
and we just imagine, and we don't even talk about slavery, and we just imagine it was happened in a vacuum where no Negro slavery occurred. John Stuart Mill was working at the East India Company. Until, and I think it, the East India Company was dissolved, I think, the year before On Liberty was uh, published, something like that. Uh, and, uh, of course, what the East India Company was doing, uh, apart from enslavement in the East Indies, was um, uh, indenturing uh, Indian persons racialized as Indian, persons racialized as Chinese, um, encouraging them to sign contracts of enslavement, indentured labor, and sail in the very same slaving ships ran to the very same plantations that were now no longer labored by enslaved persons enslaved as Negro, because that was now sort of illegal, um, but now labored by persons indentured as coolie. Um, John Stuart Mill was up to that. So John Stuart Mill's um, argument here at the end of On Liberty as to whether it's um, uh, uh, about voluntary contracts really needs to be seen in that light. Um, John Stuart Mill uh, was uh, interested in the degradation of the character of enslavers, so interested that he thought that the degradation of the character of enslavers was much worse than the degradation of the character of the enslaved. We need to be much more worried about the character of the enslavers. I don't want to make that kind of relative statement. I should simply mention that. The Haitian Revolution, dignity. Uh, what is surprised? at the way in which authors racialize as white during this period that, I mean, I cannot, I cannot, I would have loved to have lived at the end of the 18th century. It was such an exciting time. Anything could happen. I mean, uh, what's his name? Condorcet. I know that you remember Condorcet because of some voting theorem, but no, Condorcet was the, um, the philosophical brains behind the Société des Amis des Noirs. Um, uh, he, he, was, he, he came out with the philosophical rationale for the French uh, campaign against uh, Negro slavery. It wasn't by any means uh, as uh, massive as that in Britain, um, partly because it was um, uh, led by a philosopher. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, uh, just before he had his head chopped off, Condorcet was in prison, he wrote most lyrically, that uh, he thought, you know, given all the revolutions that had happened over the Americas and here, and the apparent success of uh, his campaign, uh, uh, <coughs> seemed to have had a, an influence on uh, the Haitian Revolution. They, they thought this because Léger Félicité Santonax, uh, who was the commissioner sent out to uh, um, Saint-Domingue uh, by um, uh, France, uh, he was actually a member of the Société des Amis de Noir, so uh, um, he was really excited. Uh, he thought that change had come. Of course, he got his head chopped off and we had, uh, uh, had to wait a long time for change to come. It still, still isn't here. I don't know to what extent um, uh, uh, Wilberforce is really responding to Sandelman. He does mention it a few times, especially when it comes to his letter to Talleyrand Peridot. But it's tricky. The um, persons racialized as white didn't know how to deal with this. So oftentimes they ignored it, or they ignored the, um, uh, the, the logical consequence of it. Certainly, um, uh, we can think about the way in which Susan Buck Morse has uh, um, interpreted uh, Hegel's text uh, on lordship uh, and bondage, um, understanding it as uh, having been written um, after Hegel read profusely um, uh, newspaper reports about Dessalines' campaigns, in successful campaigns in uh, Haiti. Um, of course, Hegel doesn't give any credit, and he doesn't frame this in terms of Negro slavery, which Fanon does quite well afterwards um, uh, in criticism of Hegel. But here's another example. Kant, um, Kant seems to think in his final work, Conflict of the Faculties, that um, there is a revolution in our time about which we should be excited. What was that revolution? If you read Mary Gregor's translation of Kant, um, she just says, oh, the French Revolution. Kant doesn't say what it is. I, it's not clear to me that there was a French Revolution as opposed to a Haitian Revolution uh, in 1794. There was revolutions in the Francophone world. How did Kant deal with this when he had his views, as Professor Berlusconi has um, elaborately uh, described for us, 
he had his views about what Negroes could do and could amount to. How does he uh, marry his, um, uh, his thought that um, a people should be self-governing and it's good when they uh, wrest that governance for themselves with his idea that um, uh, a person that racializes Negro can't even govern himself or herself, let alone a republic. Um, I think that this is the area for reconstituting the canon. Who was speaking at this time? Uh, who was making the arguments that did draw upon the Haitian Revolution explicitly? How, how did Hegel and Kant fail? How did other philosophers fail to interact with their social context? Mary Prince, there is a plaque outside. I urge you to go and see it. It's in Mallet Street. Uh, outside this building, to Mary Prince. It's in a very recherche place. You probably won't find it on YouTube until you look carefully. But just as Olaudo Equiano, who gives his name to the UCL Equiano Center, was, uh, wrote a narrative about his experience, and uh, his narrative, something, many think, uh, forced the campaign against the slave trade forward such that it was abolished um, uh, maybe two decades later in 1807, um, many people think that Mary Prince's narrative was uh, dispositive. Uh, it came out in 1831 in the abolition of uh, Negro slavery in the British Empire um, in 1833-1834. Why? Well, this was written by a woman. And uh, I guess for a few decades, uh, several decades, people had thought, oh yes, slavery is bad, it's painful, you know, these men, they get whipped. I guess they hadn't really thought too carefully or thought too publicly and explicitly about how this was gendered. Um, Mary Prince did us a great <coughs> um, We need to re remember her, and uh, I'd like to see her text included in uh, our curriculum. Uh, was there another question you could give me? Oh, yes. Uh, sorry, um, <coughs> uh, some overture. To some overture, yes indeed. I was looking for a, a quotation. Uh, what does he say? <coughs> uh, it says something about um, uh, we should have, uh, we should talk about Alauda Equiano and the role of free slaves, free slaves, in the uh, struggle for Britain or something like that. I mean, who are these free slaves? Why focus on Alauda Equiano? How did Negro slavery end? What prompted in 1807? Britain finally to abolish, finally, well, they didn't abolish slave, it's late, uh, Negro slavery until 1833, but finally to abolish the slave trade, when, as I mentioned to you before, the debate really took off two decades earlier in 1787, 1788, when Joseph Priestley was writing. What did it take, why did it take so long? Well, certainly, um, the British weren't really for uh, Liberté, Egalité, Fraternité, which came out in uh, 1789. And what really scared them was, uh, I guess, uh, Napoleon. And um, uh, what they saw was an opportunity to defeat Napoleon. Um, and what they were upset about, of course, was the success of the Haitian Revolution, which came to fruition with the, uh, well, the success of the saint Domingue Revolution, which came to fruition with the establishment of Haiti in 1804. This is what got them scared. This is what uh, made them think that uh, they could get a military advantage over France. Um, so um, I, I think that if we're to talk about the role of free slaves, we should be talking uh, not so much about Alauda Equiano, who although he sold lots of books, um, wasn't as decisive in uh, the national psyche as uh, the Haitian Revolution, we should be talking about the Haitian revolutionaries, Toussaint Louverture, Jean-Jacques Dessalines, and the others. I didn't learn about this at King Edward's school, though. <laughs> okay, right, we really are almost out of time, so I, I'll take uh, you and, uh, you had your hand up from last time, I'm sorry about that. Uh, if you go really, really quickly, I'll take one more, uh, but uh, try and you as quickly as possible. Yeah. I'm Robin Bunce, I'm doing history at Cambridge. Um, given Wilberforce's focus on the durability of degradation, I was wondering, did he have any ideas about how to repair that durability? 
uh, Nathan Keogh and UCL Political Theory. And Nathaniel, you said at the start that you think of over force as a critical race theorist, uh, but you didn't really explain why. So is it because of this a kind of status inequality? And if it is, do you think that account still has relevance today? Um, and can critical race theorists today draw on local force and should we be doing so? Good, thank you. And you're the last one. Well, sorry, I can't wait to just in case you expand on the question I'm about to ask. You talked about Santo Domingo in terms of Google's force, I think, 1807, or one of his letters, no, it must have been after, saying that uh, the Negroes had risen, so uh, in being. And I just want to understand that idea of rising in being. Okay. Um, so, uh, Robin, it was about, I didn't write it down, it was. Oh, sorry. Um, who was interested in the durability of Oh, yes, indeed. Okay, how do we repair it? Well, we repair it by getting married. <laughs> now, of course, Wilberforce is a product of his time, so this partly answers your question, May. Um, I don't think that we should take everything that Wilberforce says. Even if he is a critical philosopher of race, he is still a person who is socially situated, and we have to uh, think carefully about the many things he says. You'll notice that I, I flatly rejected his endorsement of the fundamental legal value of marriage. Uh, elsewhere, I, I argue that this is quite a, 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 an unhelpful institution to sustain. Uh, he does also think that, um, uh, I guess, um, moving people to another country might help. Um, so I guess there was an extent to which he was involved in the Sierra Leone project. Um, uh, my thought is that it, uh, we need to learn how to live together so I'm not quite sure that um, that sort of repair is the way to do things. Um, he doesn't really engage with reparations. It's curious that he doesn't seem, at least in what I've read so far, um, uh, which is, uh, it doesn't, uh, I mean, it, it doesn't seem to uh, reckon with the fact that um, people, once they're emancipated, need not just the institution of marriage, but I guess they need to set up a home, they need to engage in business, they need some uh, capital to begin with, and they might uh, deserve that capital on account of the fact that it's been wrested from them, robbed from them in the past. We need to have a conversation about reparations. I urge you to join uh, in that conversation by a project that, we, uh, that I'm organizing, bringing academics and activists together to converse about this in October of this year at the Black Cultural Archives and next year at the Bernie Grant Art Center in April, on the 8th of April. Bernie Grant was the MP who uh, alone in this country made political the question of reparations for European enslavement, colonization, and neo-colonization of African peoples. The 8th of April next year will be the 15th anniversary of his uh, early passing. I urge you to join that conversation. May, yes, uh, we can learn from uh, Wilberforce's analysis of status and equality, as you put it. Uh, most particularly, his focus on, well, his understanding of this thing that we're calling race. I think even in critical philosophy of race, even in that title, this is a euphemism. Uh, and uh, a colleague, Michael Banton, that no, got very, uh, Professor Michael Banton got very upset with me that we were, we were talking mostly in this conference about racial injustice, not race. I want to talk about race. Well, actually, I'm interested in racial injustice more than I'm interested in race. And in fact, what is racial injustice? Let's be explicit. In this context, it is white domination. White domination doesn't, doesn't work in reverse, as uh, racism does. Uh, and so I think that focusing upon white domination, which is what Wilberforce does, can help us in this society. Finally, uh, what was the final question? Um, oh, forgive me. Yes, indeed. They were raised in the scale of being, uh, thinks uh, Wilberforce. Actually, uh, that's a way in which Wilberforce seems to uh, recognize the way in which the Haitian Revolution, um, uh, well, uh, to be raised in the scale of being, I guess, um, is a bit ambiguous. Um, were they up there in the scale of being already, such that um, people suddenly noticed that they were actually up there and they had dignity? Or did their fighting give them dignity? 
you might actually think that uh, uh, as a matter of social practice, whether or not we actually all have dignity, such that we're all equal in having dignity, um, doesn't really matter. In social practice, we have to earn dignity from each other. We have to protest. Uh, the protest might come in various forms, so it might be as violent as uh, a violent revolution, but <coughs> just walking tall is a way of protesting. It's a way of saying, I am here, take me seriously. Um, I think that uh, um, many philosophers have um, engaged in you know, whether all humans are equal, whether all humans have dignity. But what seems to me to be a much uh, more profitable enterprise is how is it that we get dignity, uh, that we get respect from each other, the respect that's accorded to uh, items that are worthy of respect, items with dignity, and how is it that we give that respect? Thank you. Let's thank the public.